and uh, understand the difference between being a victim and uh, it's really the title, Charlie's title this morning is uh, Justice, God Victimization and God's Justice. And we're going to try to identify when a person crosses the line from being a victim to being a perpetrator. And uh, let me just use the, this illustration. I remember this actually, uh, Dr. Rick Flanders, and I probably should have just found his sermon from Ezekiel chapter 18 and, and had us watch it for the Sunday school this morning. It was a great message that he preached some years ago when we were on our, our previous location. But he preaches the sour grapes, and we'll look at that passage actually a little bit about how the children of Israel had a saying that the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. And what they meant by that was that, you know, our dads taught us this habit. Or is this is just the way we were raised up. It's sort of, uh, you can explain it this way, okay? A kid grew up and uh, he's in a home of a father who's a thief. And right away, the dad who's a thief uses him as a decoy to help to steal. And the kid just grows up stealing. And when he gets older, he gets arrested or he begins to, uh, his conscience bothers him. And his question, the question is, you know, why did I become a thief? His father taught him to steal or had him steal. Um, and so somebody would ask him, you know, why are you a thief? And he'd say, well, because my dad is a thief. You know, and then all the things that his dad did, you know, the things usually go along with that, abusive, alcoholic, uh, you know, brutal, uh, abusive of his wife and his children. Why are you this way? Well, my dad was this way. And then they went to the kid's dad and said, why are you this way? And he said, well, my dad was this way. And if they could have gone to that guy's dad, he'd have said, my dad and my dad and my dad and my dad. You see, there's no end to that, is there, when it comes to, uh, you know, so whose fault was it? Whose fault is it that you have a problem? Well, it's my dad's fault. Whose fault is it your dad had a problem? Well, it's his dad's fault. Whose fault is it? And it just goes on and on and on. There's no end, is there? And that's sort of a fatalistic viewpoint, if you think about it. If you look at life that way, you are going to be so negative and so fatalistic. Everything is going to be something that nothing can be done about. And that's the frustration of politics to me, isn't it? Yeah. The frustration of politics to me is that you know that people talk about problems, and honestly, when politicians get to... D.C., when they get elected to take care of the problems, you know they're just going to go to D.C. and be like all the other problems. It's like they run on a platform, they promise you what they're going to do, they get to D.C., and they become part of the fraternity, and their job, their goal then just becomes staying part of the fraternity, being part of, of you know, the swamp, as it's been recently dubbed. And they become part of the swamp, and they just stay there and never come back. I think of in Kansas, uh, Senator Bob Dole, who really years back in the, I think it would have been in the 1980s, made some really great promises to the constituents in Kansas, and he was from out in Russell, Kansas, and he went to Washington, D.C. I remember being in high school in the 1990s and going by Senator Bob Dole's office just to see if he was there and to meet him. He wasn't, he wasn't in. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I remember when he ran for president, he was a terrible candidate, but he, he ran for president. And one of the things that they made a big issue out of when he ran for president was they checked to see where he lived in Russell, Kansas. And technically in Russell, Kansas, he has a room at a friend's house. And then they tried to check and see when was the last time he went back to Kansas. And the answer was <laughs> he never goes to Kansas. He left and went to D.C. and he's, he's part of that crowd. He lives there and he couldn't care less about Kansas or its his constituency. Uh, you know, he's, he's part, of that, part of that mess. And so politics to me is sort of fatalistic. I, I, I appreciate it when a politician thumbs his nose at the rest of his comrades or his peers and says, you know, I'm going to do right no matter what. I, anybody ever watched uh, John Smith goes to, is it, who is it, uh, Mr. Smith goes to Washington? Ever watch that show? Where Mr. Smith goes to Washington and he thinks, you know, because his father was a politician, was an honest man, he thinks that uh, everybody, you know, he's going to really be serving the American people and all that. And he goes there and he realizes they expect him just to be a figure. And they don't want him to buck the establishment, just go along with whatever, take the payouts and kickbacks and all these things. And, and uh, Mr. Smith won't do that. He stands against the establishment and ends up, uh, anyway, it's great. It's, it's a great movie. 
Um, and that's what you wish Washington, D.C. had. Some people would just go there and, you know, do what's right. Stand. Change things. Um, to put your faith in horses, kings, and men is an exercise in futility. But listen to me, my friend. That isn't true with God. And a Christian who has a victim mindset, that is, this is the way it is, I don't have a choice about it, I can't change anything, and this is the way it will always be, is an individual who, first of all, has a very, very dim view of God's ability. And secondarily, a person with that kind of a mindset is an individual uh, who really doesn't get what it is to be born again and saved. Do you remember the liberation of salvation? The first time that your guilt was used to good effect. Guilt's a good thing. The first time guilt did any good was the time that you realized you were such a sinner that you needed God's grace. And you realized that God's grace was the love of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for your sins. And then you received the gift of eternal life. And when you received eternal life, you were saved and you were free. Free from guilt. Free from sin. Oh, guilt comes back. It, it, you know, it tries to come and tell you lies. But when you really understand the cross, my friend, you understand that the victim mentality is not one that you need to embrace. Now next week, Charlie is going to have the express privilege of telling us how not to be a victim. How to get beyond victimization. And uh, I wish I could teach that class, but no, I get to teach the class that he gave me, uh, the Sunday school topic, of the, the difference between being a victim and a perpetrator, or God's justice uh, and victimization. Okay, so here we are in 2 Samuel in chapter 21, and we'll go ahead and read our text this morning. And uh, we'll read this story about David. There was a, then there was a famine in the days of David three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his, <clears throat> for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. And the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal, to the children of Israel and Judah. Wherefore David said unto the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? Did you notice those parentheses? They give a little explanation about who the Gibeonites were. The Gibeonites were not supposed to be there, but because of the promise that the children of Israel had made with the Ammonites, or the Amorites, they were not supposed to kill the Gibeonites. And so uh, David's question was, What shall I do for you, and wherewith shall I make the atonement, that ye may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said unto him, We will have no silver, nor gold of Saul, nor of his house, neither for us shalt thou kill any man in Israel. And he said, What ye shall say, that will I will do for you. And they answered the king, The man that consumed us, and that devised against us, that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the coasts of Israel, let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, and we will hang them up unto the Lord in Gibeah of Saul, whom the Lord did choose, and the king said, I'll give them. And the king spared, but the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the Lord's oath that was between them, between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. But the king took the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, uh, Aya, who she bare unto Saul, Armoni and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Michal, the daughter of Saul, whom she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzillai and Meholathai, the, the Meholathai. And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the hill before the Lord. And they fell all seven together and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days, in the beginning of the barley harvest. Now this is an interesting story, isn't it? What do you think about it? Let's have some feedback. Those men were to be hanged. What? Did they do something to deserve hanging? No. Relative. They are relatives. That's they're it. just relatives. That's what Mrs. Dolan's answer is. Well, they're just relatives. Uh, did you notice whose sons David picked? That, that one lady? The daughter of Saul? What was her name? McCall. McCall? 
was there a little bit of um, maybe a bitterness with David and her sons? I mean, could you say, well, you know, it's it's uh, it's very interesting that David picked Michal's children to be hanged, couldn't you? I mean, she was the wife of David that was given to her, and then she rejected David. Turned it, didn't didn't want him because she'd been given another husband, and she wanted him instead of David. Yeah, real mess there, wasn't there? Okay, let me just say first of all, how many of y'all personally know any of the seven sons of Saul? How many of y'all personally met them? How many of you know that they were good men? We actually don't know, do we? I remember years ago asking a question that kind of shocked me. <clears throat> I was teaching in my first year as an assistant pastor in Delray. I was teaching an adult Sunday school class. And we were talking about King Solomon. And somehow, when we were talking about justice, we asked the question, O.J. Simpson got brought into the conversation. And we asked the question, how can a man who's guilty, you know, be allowed to go free? And I asked the question, I said, we all know O.J.'s guilty, don't we? Doesn't everybody know O.J. killed Nicole Simpson? Don't we know that? Yeah. Really. We do, everyone doesn't think so. We do, everyone doesn't, Lee says, we think so, we... Yeah, uh, Chuck says we think we think he did. The fact of the matter is that some evidence which we think would have been incriminating was thrown out because of the mishandling of the prosecution. None of us sat on the jury. None of us were actually well. Okay, maybe some of you all are. You know the kind of um, you, you just you love the drama. You're one of the inquirer readers or something like that, and you just want to know. What's going on? And so you just you remain in front of the television, transfixed through every bit of the trial, and you watched the whole thing. I've, I have watched some of the trial, a little bit of it, and uh, you know I know the famous term, you know, or phrase: if it does not fit, if the glove not, does not fit, you must acquit. And the great job that Ken Starr and everyone did on the uh, is is really a grand, probably in my lifetime, the first time. That it, no, not the first time. I've heard I've heard it put this way: the first time that you know this is all on television and the whole world's watching. But actually, Al Capone would have been one of the first, as I think of it, that you know really had a lot of popularity and and notoriety, and people would have been watching that trial. So, but here's the deal: I'm like Chuck. I think I think he was guilty. The crazy drive he did. How many of y'all watched the Bronco? You know, That's driving the Bronco. Yeah, I, wa I was. I didn't know who O.J. Simpson was. My cousins did, and we were at the farm in Bennington, Kansas. And we were, all of us were coming out there. My cousins were there, and I remember my cousin go, Joel going, "The juice." That was what they called O.J. He said, "The juice is like he, they think he killed his wife, and he's running from the police, and it's all on television." And you got the helicopter footage of O.J. driving 40 mile an hour on the interstate. And the other interstates stopped, and so it was an interesting thing for me to watch. You know, police all driving slowly behind a guy, slowly driving. You know, and and then uh, he found what did he, did he go home and give himself up? I'm trying to remember where he. Yeah. Anyway, so he and we watched it. So I watched that. I never knew who O.J. Simpson was before that. Now, he's, he's way more famous to me than he was when he was a football player and went the Heisman Trophy winner and so forth. I think, though, uh, the other day I watched a, an interview, a clip of him, and they tried to get him to talk about when he killed his wife, and he said he didn't do it. He said, I didn't kill her. Even though he wrote a book, you know, blah, 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 explaining how he would have done it if he had actually done it and so forth. The fact of the matter is, is that there may be some people besides O.J. that walk this earth who know whether he's guilty or innocent, but I don't actually know. I just, I don't know. I think he was, but the media really leads you on these. They give you information to make you think things. And they definitely want you to think he's guilty, but I don't know. I just don't know. All I know is what I know. I don't know everything that the jurists saw. 
I don't know what OJ did. I don't know. He may be complicit. He may be guilty. I don't know. But we all think we do. And we, we, we actually, in this account of the Scripture, we're standing in the place of judgment on God by saying Saul's sons were innocent. Because we don't know that they were, first of all. Now these would be his grandsons, Michal's sons. Now I know Michal's, Michal was a liar. Remember when she lied to her daddy about David being sick? I know she was deceitful. I know that she, to a degree, was unfaithful. So I know that she had bad character, and there's a chance because the children have no choice about being evil. I'm kidding, being sarcastic about that, but there's a chance that her children were not so innocent. But the point is we don't know. And the second point is that it actually isn't God that asked for the sons of Saul. It was the men of Gibeah. No, not, not the men of Gibeah. The, uh, what were they? The, uh, the Gibeonites. Yeah, okay, so Gibeonites. All right. So let's go to uh, Deuteronomy 32.4. And I just want to look at a couple of questions and answers. We're going to stay with Charlie's notes for a a minute here and then we'll veer away. Um, <clears throat> God is just and He does what's right. Psalm 32, Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain, my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass. <clears throat> Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. Verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all His ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is He. Wait, I'm sorry. What, what, what Deuteronomy 32.4. Okay. Deuteronomy 32.4. Okay, what is, what is true about God? He's a rock. His way is perfect. All His ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is He. Do you believe that? you believe that? Were Saul's grandsons innocent? We have no idea. Well, they may have been victims. In other words, let, see, I want, to, I want to help us to understand a couple of truths. The first truth is God's perfect. He's just, He's right, and He never does wrong. And I want us also to understand on this side, life isn't perfect. We don't live in a perfect world. Over here, we have something that's our rock. In other words, unmovable, unshakable, unalterable truth, and that is that God is perfect. And over here, we have a reality that life isn't perfect. Now let's scale back just a little bit and let's ask the question, when did life stop being perfect? What? The Garden of Eden. At the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. When man sinned, life ceased to be perfect. And at the same time, God was still perfect. In the Garden, it grieved God that He created man. Let's go back, uh, we'll, if you'll permit, uh, to Genesis. Genesis in chapter, is it chapter uh, 5? That's three, isn't it? Three. Well, that's the fall of man. I'm, I'm going to go to when it grieved God that He made man. Genesis chapter 5, and us, maybe it's chapter 6. six? Yeah, 6 verse 5. Okay, so that's my list X yet kicking in. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and it repeat, repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And God said, the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. God is the rock. His way is perfect. All His ways are judgment. He's the God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is He. Man sinned against God and is inherently 
imperfect, born a sinner, born to sin. And God, who will never destroy the earth again in a flood, is grieved by sin. Who's the victim? Who's the victim of sin? God is. Isn't He? Who's sin against? Who is sin against? God. Who is offended by sin? Who commits sin? Has God ever sinned? No. He's perfect. Okay. The difference between a victim and a perpetrator is that sin is against you if you're a victim. And if you're a perpetrator, sin is against someone else. And that's a clear definition for victim versus perpetrator. You get the definition? You understand it? In other words, an innocent person is one who's never sinned. A sinner is someone who has sinned against the innocent, and that's ultimately against God. You know, there's a lack of clarity about that. You say, Pastor, is there any such thing as a person who's a victim? Absolutely. There absolutely is. But the difference between a victim... I, we're not talking about that today. I get to talk about being a perpetrator today. Charlie gets to be talking about being a victim next week. I'm the victim of Charlie's schedule. Okay, so I can't help this. All right, so we're not dealing today with how to be... Uh, how, how to have victory over being a victim. And there is hope for victims. And Charlie gets to share hope while I get to call victims perpetrators today. Or I get to delineate the difference between a victim and a perpetrator. And so, do you feel my victim syndrome so kicking in? Okay, I am a victim here today. I could be in teen Sunday school talking about friends and eating donuts. But no, Charlie is in New York City visiting a friend who happens to be a female. And I am teaching his Sunday school... A, Calling victims perpetrators. Okay, so here we are. <laughs> All right. Now, and you're a victim too, aren't you, Luke? What kind of donut would you be eating today? We don't know because Safeway closed. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> the reality of it is. Not as good as yeah. the Safeway <laughs> Okay, but the reality of it is, guys, get this. Listen to me. If you're a teenager and you're here, this is important for you too. The notion that anyone is undeserving of evil, first of all, ignores the fact that God doesn't deserve evil, and yet it's perpetrated against Him. In other words, the idea, why does God allow, the question is, why does God allow perpetration against Him? If you think that God cannot relate to being a victim, think about what you're saying for a minute. you get what I'm saying? In other words, why does God let this happen in my life? Well, first of all, let's be sympathetic to the person who has been the most victimized, shall we? I mean, it's been tough for you, but think about God for a second. How far can we take that? God's never done anything wrong. He was never born a sinner. He never committed sin against anybody. And all sin is against Him. Everything that's been done to you actually has been done to God. Not only is He the victim, but He's responsible to judge the wicked. So every problem has become His. Isn't that kind of actually comforting though? I mean, at least He's someone that can handle the problems. And, and I'm a victim, but it's His problem. That's what you're going to learn next week. I'm a victim, but it's God's problem. He's the one who has to exact vengeance. And He's the one who is able to bind up the brokenhearted. He's the one uh, who gave us His Son who said about Him or was prophesied about Him that a bruised reed will He not break and a smoking flax will He not quench. He's the one who's gentle and merciful and loving. He's the one who understands what it is to be a victim and who also can judge the perpetrator. And he makes it all okay. The first thing we need to understand is 
the whole victim mindset. Yes? Can David have just refused to go along with this whole thing? No, no, he couldn't have. Um, actually, first of all, he'd given his word. And secondly, God, God was judging Israel because of what Saul had done. In other words, there, and this is what Charlie wanted us to get, there's a certain line where, okay, Saul did it, not us. But Saul was zealous, as we read in our text, for the cause of Israel and Judah. And so that's, he said, those stinking Gibeonites, they don't deserve to be in Israel. They, the, 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 the Ammonites or the Amorites, they tricked us, acting like they come on a long journey and getting a peace sworn between us and all these things. And what they did was wrong. And Saul went and exacted his human justice on them. But God honored the covenant that they had made in God's name. And so God caused Israel to have a famine. After three years, David finally goes, God, what in the world did we do? And God said, well, Saul did it, actually. But you're, he did it on the behalf of Israel. He represented you. And you're guilty. And so... David's like, okay, God's brought this to our attention, and he went and did business on it. So I think the answer is no. I think the answer was, um, the answer is that God's right, he's perfect. We don't know about the sons of Saul, and the thing, I'm glad you brought it up because I didn't mention the third thing. Uh, we don't know that they were innocent, but also the other thing is that we do know that everyone who has ever been born cursed by sin dies. Right? And so the way that a person dies in the amount of years that you're given on earth, first of all, you're not entitled to anything. Jonathan died. Jonathan, Saul's son, if ever an innocent man, had a tragic plight. And yet, there's no tragedy in Jonathan's life because he was a good man. And so if they were good men and they died, they died like courageous good men died. You can be courageous and good. When, you, when you're on your deathbed, it'll do no good to plead and say, I was courageous and good. You're going to die because of sin. The sin curse. And you're not a victim because you're a sinner. So the notion that these individuals would have had a longer or shorter life, yeah, you know, not the way we want to go. How many of y'all are going to die for sure the way you want to? I don't even know how I want to. Anthony, you know for sure the way you're going to die? Sleep. Sleeping? That's, that's, you know how you want to die, but how you know it's going to happen that way? Well, no, that's, that's how I want to die. But yeah, that's how you want to. You don't know that. You, you know? Me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying. <laughs> I'm going to take a, uh, a Tesla Roadster, uh, Roadster and get shot off to the moon, starved to death. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to be that just off the top of my head. Yeah, I don't. I, I'll be honest with you. I've been reckon, personally. I've reconciled with death long, long ago, actually. And uh, I, I, I do. Uh, when the scripture says this is this is uh, not part of our lesson, but when the scripture says teach us to number our days, every year of my life I take that passage of scripture more seriously. And I do ask God. I do ask God for a period of life that I would be allowed to live for Him. And so I don't have a guarantee of God, but I live as though God has granted what I've asked for. So I live my life on the basis of what I've asked God for. And if God sees fit to say, no, you're going off in a roadster, then that's just the way it goes, right? Uh, so <laughs> I'll probably never drive one of those things now. I'll probably be paranoid about it. Okay, sin is always a willful choice of disobedience. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 18. And um, let's look at God's delineation with Israel. That really clarifies clarifies guilt and innocence. <clears throat> now, if if you're a young person, the language of the Scripture here is a little bit lofty. I would say, in other words, it's not the way we would talk today. But the truth of the matter is, is that there's a lot here, so try to get it, okay? Try to, try to tune in to this passage and really understand. Ezekiel 18, verse 1. This is Ezekiel telling something supernatural that God told him. The word of the Lord came unto me again, saying, What mean ye 
that ye use this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The father eating sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, saith the Lord, ye shall not have occasion any more to use this proverb in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Now there's our answer, isn't there, about Saul's sons? What did they do? Well, as relates to the Gibeonites, as far as we know, nothing. What caused their death? Sin. Sin. Were they victims? Well, that isn't what caused their death. Perhaps they were victims of Saul's crime. Their grandfather's crime. But if they'd been sinless, they would not have been under the sin curse. Do you get that? In other words, at some point, a victim has to also acknowledge, I'm also a sinner. Whereas I may have been a victim in this circumstance, but I'm not a victim in every circumstance. I'm also a sinner. Hear me now. Every victim is also a sinner. Every victim is also a sinner. And not every judgment is in kind. Not every judgment is in kind. Now, when you're being chastised, I believe that the chastisement normally is in kind. A person who's being chastised for sin, where God's trying to get you to do right, a lot of times, He'll chastise you in kind. For instance, if you're a teenager and you have your first vehicle, and I'm not talking about Shamir here, although Shamir, be warned. Uh, <laughs> if you're a teenager and you have your first vehicle, and your parents say, I saw the way you left the house today, and you're driving too fast, and you better quit it, or something's going to happen. You're going to hurt somebody, or you're going to wreck your car, or you're going to get a ticket. And if said teenager were to, that very same day, take off too fast, and on the way to school, get a ticket, It would seem instantly in the teenager's mind, you know something? You'd just be hearing the words ringing through your head. My wife is, is like my parent now with this sort of thing. My wife is the one that says, you're going to, and you're going to deserve it. And I'm like, stop saying stuff like that. I don't need to have your words ringing in my head when I'm chastised. You know, like, <laughs> don't tell me what's going to, somebody's going to, or you're going to, really, you know, that little, those words of warning, you know, and you're like, don't tell me that. I want to hear that. Somebody's going to do to you or something's going to happen if you keep doing whatever. And, uh, you know, and when it happens, the first thing you think of is, oh, man. Didn't they tell me that would happen? That's what they said would happen. I did this. And you know chastisement's in kind. And you know, <clears throat> it's interesting that people that God is chastising for sin, it seems that the chastisement's related. Sometimes it's a health issue that has to do with an area of sin, sometimes it's a whatever, but it just seems like it's connected. Uh, years ago, and I, I remember uh, seeing some pamphlets by, uh, who was the preacher, he used to preach, and he wrote a lot of pamphlets for the sword of the Lord, and he used to write the scamper of the squirrel pamphlets. What was Hugh the guy? Pyle. Hugh Pyle, thank you, Joel. Hugh Pyle wrote The Curse of AIDS. I think John Rice wrote about it as well. And I remember some guys in seminary laughing about oh, you know, these, you know, these, these what you call it, these sicknesses that people get AIDS is a curse of sin, and making fun of that. But actually, the truth of the matter is, is that not in every case there are a few notable exceptions, and you could say as well there are notably few exceptions. But almost always, a person who has AIDS contracted as a result of sin. And it's just a fact. And you say, Pastor, that, you know what? Uh, listen, get over yourself. That's a fact. It's just the way it is. You know, just, just stop with the arguments that aren't really arguments. They're just a liberal mindset that's willing to judge God. I, I shouldn't use the word liberal because that's not the accurate use of the technical definition. It's a wicked mindset that's willing to judge God instead of accept personal responsibility. And so victimization, oftentimes, in other words, this is my this is my Sunday school lesson. Charlie assigned me to be mean to victims, and so 
here we are, you know, bear with me just a bit. Okay, now, in verse 5 of Ezekiel 18, God said, A soul that sinneth it shall die, but if a man be just, and do that which is lawful and right, and hath not eaten upon the mountains, neither hath lifted up his eyes, eaten upon the mountains, that's meat offered to idols, you see that? In the Old Testament? All right. Neither hath lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, neither hath defiled his neighbor's wife, neither hath come near to a menstruous woman, and hath not oppressed any, but hath restored to the debtor his pledge, hath spoiled none by violence, hath given his bread to the hungry, and hath covered the naked with the garment. He that hath not given forth upon usury, neither hath taken any increase, that hath withdrawn his hand from iniquity, hath executed true judgments between man and man, hath walked in my statutes, and hath kept my judgments to deal truly. He is just... He shall surely live, saith the Lord God. And God here says to these poor victims of captivity, if you do everything right, you won't be judged for doing wrong. But did you go through the list with me? Did you see that list? Name the innocent one. What Jew, and, and, and again, pardon me, but what Jew was not responsible for usury? Today, today, it is just a known characteristic of the people genetically that God has chosen that they'll take advantage of anybody they can financially. You say, Pastor, there are exceptions. Yeah, they're innocent of the stereotype. See, you may have a father who was wicked, but you don't have to be. And the notion that God's judging you because of something your father has done is just overlooking the laundry list of things that you're guilty for. Victim. Again, he is a rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are judgment. The God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. I never did anything to anybody. That's a liar. <laughs> you may not have done what someone did to you. Yeah. Then again, you may have. A heartbreaking tragedy that is prolific in our society today is sexual abuse. It's probably the most, well, it's spiritual. Any kind of physical relationship has a spiritual relationship. We saw that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 uh, this, this last week. And so it has a spiritual effect on a person. And a victim of that kind of sin has not only been wounded physically, they have a spiritual wound. And it's an evil thing. And it's pervasive. But the tragedy of it is, is that it's repetitive. Almost without exception, I stand by this statement, and I don't care who wants to contradict it. I've never had it contradicted by someone who was telling, uh, who was actually didn't end up confessing that I was right in the end. They may not have said you're right, but they gave me the evidence to support that I was right. Almost without exception, a person who was in the homosexual lifestyle was abused as a child. There may be the exception, but I do not know it. I don't know the exception. Okay, There may be, the, I'm not saying there isn't one. Again, the exception would be notable but it would not be representative. And homosexuals commit crimes against children. Anyone that thinks, and, and, and I'm not concerned that this is a controversial statement, it, it isn't controversial factually, it's controversial as far as political correctness goes. Anyone who thinks it's safe to put a sexual deviant with children is ignoring warning flags, warning signs 
that are just, I mean, you're just nuts. And you'll bear the consequences for it. To have a homosexual in a school who's a teacher is to have a predator in a school. You say, Pastor, I don't like that. I know you don't. We have been programmed and brainwashed so much that we've checked our brains at the door. But it's a person who is sexually deviant. And you put them in charge of children. And there's a reason they want to be in that position. Say they don't do anything. Well, what about programming? Is it not harmful to program our children to teach them perversion? I've been told by our teenagers what the education, the sexual education teaches. And they're programming kids to open their minds to something. And my friend, the fact of the matter is that is despicable. That is an abominable thing to do to children. To expose children that kind of sexual sin is abuse. It's abusive. We ought to be protesting it every single year. We ought to be calling it out every single year. The abuse of our children by exposing them to things that they should never know, they should never have to deal with. Teaching them from a youth that they may not be the gender that God has made them to be and just causing the confusion that comes with that subsequently. Teaching them that to uh, be what they actually are, a man or a woman, male or female, is actually wrong and just putting that kind of pressure on them for that. It's evil. But I've found that it's a vicious cycle. The abuser be, being a victim and then the, then the victim being the abuser. The victim, perpetrator, victim, perpetrator. It's just cycle, 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 cycle. Uh, listen, start liking that kind of counsel. It's the only thing that will change or help anything. We are degrading so fast. We have so many people that are... So, we're creating so many new victims. There are so many more victims than there were 10 years ago, my friend. There were not this many victims 10 years ago. And the normalization of wickedness has created more victims. God says that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And the person who sins is the person who is the perpetrator. Can a perpetrator also be a victim? Initially. Does a victim get judged? for what they had no choice in? No. What do they get judged for? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. They get judged for their sin. Hey friend, I'm a victim. You're a victim. We can all hold hands and sing a little song. We're all victims, aren't we? Realist I'm, not, I'm not making fun this morning in that sense. We're all victims. We actually are. And God won't judge you for that. He's a victim. And He'll judge the perpetrator. Uh-oh. We're all sinners. <laughs> He's not going to judge me for what people did to me. He's going to judge me for what I do to others. Most victims perpetrate. And they are able to just cut in half their focus, their vision. They're able to just put blinders on and only see above this line or see inside these lines. And all they see with their narrow viewpoint is what's been done to them. But they don't have the broader viewpoint of saying, you know what, I've done things to others. Victims wreck their children, wreck their marriages. I've seen victims I've seen victims harm their wives, harm their husbands, harm their children, harm their parents, literally leave a wake of destruction everywhere they go because they're a victim. And you want to talk to them about you did this and they'll say I can't believe you said that to me. Do you know what's been done to me? Yeah? So I guess it's okay for you to wreck other people's lives. We'll just overlook that. 
See, that's the mindset of a victim. Next week, Charlie's going to tell you about the mindset of the victorious. Come back. It's a positive message. Father, thank you so much for what we learned today. I pray that you'd help us to absorb it, retain it. We ask in Jesus' name.